Hello, it's uh, my privilege to moderate this uh, panel of uh, restructuring experts after having heard about some optimism in uh, certain parts of the shipping space earlier this morning. Uh, the restructuring part is, of course, the more depressing part. But we have very good people to take us through that. Um, from the far end, it's uh, Don Featherstone, who is in the restructuring business of Ernst & Young. It's Kevin O'Hara, who is managing partner at uh, American Marine uh, Advisors uh, in New York. And it's uh, Axel Sipman, who is the managing director of Navas Corporate Finance in Hamburg. So there is some geographical um, spread and maybe some different perspectives. Today may be the day, maybe right now, maybe in a couple of hours, or maybe tomorrow, but the expected filing by Cedril of its uh, Chapter 11 um, proceedings. Um, it may or may not happen, may or may not happen um, but it's a very spectacular backdrop, I think, to the kind of discussion we're having. Cedril has based on what's in the public domain, more than 10 billion of debt. There are banks, bondholders, leasing companies, yards, um, banks with derivative exposure, 44 banks in 12 syndicates, three Norwegian bonds, two US bonds, several leasing arrangements. They have business in 29 jurisdictions. They have close to 70 units. It's a pretty messy picture. And still the rumor, at least in the Norwegian papers, is that there may be ongoing discussions with one or two funds who look at this as an investment opportunity. And that's exactly the title of our little session, Restructuring as a Business and Investment Opportunity. And if someone is willing to buy into such a messy situation as the serial situation seems to be, it's a pretty good um, sign perhaps that restructuring situations can be opportunities for investors. So I just uh, start off by asking uh, Kevin, from your US perspective, do you think that uh, this is an opportunity for M&A activity? Uh, I certainly do. Uh, we, when we do a restructuring, we always think of it in terms of M&A. Um, it may not be the primary focus, but there's always at least a parallel process whereby you're looking for other investors that may come in, as, 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 as you've seen in TK Offshore, and as you alluded to, potentially in, in Cedril. Um, there, there are certainly always active investors out there looking. Um, so we always have that in the back of our mind. And do you have similar experience in the, in the German uh, context? I would first of all say, let's look at, uh, you know, for whom can a restructuring be an opportunity? I mean, uh, there's usually at least three participants. There's, of course, the current owner that is facing the restructuring. There is the lender and, 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 and there's the investors. Um, so I think very important, let's start with the owner. Um, as an owner, you know, if you don't manage the restructuring successfully, you run the risk of going out of business. And in so far, it's not a question of, of, of an opportunity, it's just a question very often of survival. But you're either proactive about it and, and try to develop a solution that basically finds the appreciation at least of your lender, and um, that often then naturally has to involve investors, um, or you basically you shut down your business. Uh, so it's catching the last straw, which um, is, 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 is all about the opportunity. To a certain degree, what we also observe is that some people take restructuring um, as an opportunity to buy back their own debt at a discount and so far just uh, create a windfall profit to the balance sheet. Um, for investors, of course, I think it's, it's, it's very obvious uh, restructuring and so far can be a big opportunity as it always involves a certain complexity. Um, you face a lot less competition than if you just go into the S&P market with it for, for vessels that are widely spread. Um, and, and sometimes uh, the complexity is at such that only a few investors, a few uh, parties are actually able to manage uh, the process successfully. And last but not least, looking at the lender, I think it's an, an opportunity if you basically um, have decided to move out of ship financing or to shrink your portfolio significant. Um, there can be all sorts of benefits. First of all, you try to avoid you know, really enf um, forcing on the asset, which is always extremely uh, costly. Second, 
restructurings uh, absorb an enormous amount of capacity, so a transaction and, and, and basically asking the ship owner to look for new sources of capital can also make your life uh, structurally wise a lot easier. Um, Ken, do you see uh, the restructuring situation as an M&A &A opportunity in your experience? Uh, Don, excuse me. Yeah, certainly. Um, I've, uh, I agree with Kevin. I think there are certainly a lot of elements to a uh, restructuring situation that are similar to that of an M&A situation. I've also heard restructuring referred to as just uh, another form of a hostile takeover. Uh, and we've seen uh, a lot of those situations. I think if you're following the EMAS bankruptcy and, and the involvement of uh, the SEAM uh, uh, empire in that restructuring, that, that he's, uh, he's done some very clever things with his investment in, in that restructuring. Um, and I, I've, I've also uh, tend to think of it as another form of investment. The documentation, particularly debt documentation, gives all the stakeholders a chance to call a pause in the process with the company. And uh, during that pause, all the stakeholders have the opportunity to decide whether they want to re-up their investment in the company if they're an incumbent uh, a lender. And for new money providers, and particularly in shipping and offshore, we're seeing the need for new money providers much, much more often. For new money providers, it gives them the opportunity to decide whether they want to, uh, to put capital uh, into the situation. So right now, uh, if I talk to my, uh, my fund friends, there, are, there is a lot, and I mean a lot of capital in Europe, and I'm sure the situation is the same in the United States, on the sidelines right now looking for opportunities to invest in restructuring situations. I think the key is to find that market clearing price between some of the incumbent lenders uh, and the new money and finding those particular niche opportunities uh, that are particularly appealing to the hedge fund community. So you feel it's uh, more like uh, the fund industry that would be the potential new investors rather than industry players? Um, in terms of volume, I've certainly seen a lot more activity from uh, the fund industry. Uh, but there are some notable deals out there uh, from uh, industrial players, particularly in Norway. Uh, Ferd Investment has been uh, quite an active investor in, uh, in restructuring situations. Um, and uh, as I said, the Seam, uh, Christian Seam has been quite a, an active investor in restructuring situations, both on his, on his own account, but through uh, some funds here in London as well. Um, but I think predominantly uh, you're looking at the big funds that are, have large pools of capital that they need to put to work that are uh, looking for these unique uh, opportunities to exploit some inefficiencies in the market. Meaning that maybe the restructuring wave, which is uh, hitting uh, maybe particularly the oil service business, but some parts of shipping as well, will not really trigger consolidation, <laughs> if, if, if that analysis is, is correct. So I, I think we've seen some consolidation, but given the length and the magnitude of the downturn, it hasn't been what I would necessarily expect. Uh, so I think in, on the sort of the platform supply, offshore uh, supply uh, vessel side in Norway, they've seen some uh, consolidation, haven't seen it that much in the drilling market, um, and haven't seen it so much in the offshore services market, I guess, if there's been a trend in consolidation, it's been big companies merging with big companies. But what we haven't seen is a shakeout of the middle and smaller size companies. Uh, and that's typically what you would see in a downturn. Rolf, well, you just um, asked the question specifically about, about the German market. And I think earlier we saw a slide here on the banking panel that a very, very substantial uh, part of the global shipping debt is still with uh, German and European lenders. Um, and, and one lesson to learn over the last eight years is really um, that the speed at which um, a, a basically transactions happen is significantly increased. Um, and it, whereas in, over the first, first three, four years, banks really try to keep the doors shut, be quiet, you know, just waive repayments, 
um, the mood has changed tremendously. That's partly driven by some lenders, and we've just seen the chart about Commerce Bank, very impressive, how fast they've downsized the portfolio. And any lender has a little bit of a different approach. Uh, some lenders have also changed the approach how they uh, go about the downsizing. And, and so there's really a multitude of different structures, and there's also a multitude of investor backgrounds. I mean, of, of course, the fund industry um, uh, has, uh, you know, the, the, the approach to go particularly for the large ticket deals, complex uh, loan um, uh, disposals. But uh, we're seeing a lot of Greek investors. We're seeing a lot of consolidation. I mean, there were some very prominent announcements um, this summer. Um, so I would say, yes, consolidation has uh, finally started. Uh, consolidation is not the perfect solution to, to every single case. I believe there's still a firm role for medium and, and, and smaller ship owners with healthy balance sheets going forward. And, and, and they are very active buyers and, and partly offer solutions. Um, so I find it very hard to say, you know, this is the plain vanilla structure, this is the general trend. There is, there's so much diversity and, and every single situation really requires a tailor-made solution. But one element which uh, any investor has to consider is what happens to the existing debt. And uh, while we've seen uh, bondholders uh, being willing to convert to equity, uh, many banks are very conservative in that regard. And uh, they tend to say that they have secured loans. And uh, it may be a question as to the value of the security. But uh, the willingness to book losses uh, by banks have been have not been uh, particularly uh, noticeable in, in recent years. And is that sort of a real problem for investors to come into the space, simply because there's too much debt and the banks are not willing to play along? What would you say to that, Kevin? Uh, I certainly think that's, a, that's an issue. Um, it's, it can be regional. Um, there, there are banks in the United States, for example, where we've seen them take uh, write-downs almost immediately when they see a downturn. Uh, and I think um, you know the case may be different elsewhere, and you, you start to see the end result in restructurings where you might have similar sized companies, some which end up with a full balance sheet full of debt, and some which, to your point, have have equitized, and in the end of the day, they might be at, at a disadvantage uh, in in the market with that with that debt overhang. Yeah. I mean, let's not forget it's a bank's task to basically lend money and provide loans and not own uh, equity. I mean, in, in, in Germany, I think 30, 40 years ago, uh, German industry was partly owned by, uh, uh, by, by German banks. Uh, but in the meantime, regulation, capital regulation has changed tremendously. So it's very inconvenient um, uh, uh, for banks from a risk-weighted uh, uh, capital approach to own shares next to a lot of problems around um, taking active influence and, and, and consolidation issues. So I can fully understand why certain lenders say, well, if we are to take equity, we'll, we'll, we'll try to limit that. Um, and I, I wouldn't subscribe that there hasn't been enough activity. We should keep in mind that there were some banks that really had a strong focus uh, on, on, on shipping. So the shipping portfolio was very sizable. And um, you know, you, if, you can't restructure your entire portfolio in one go. Um, so this was all about spreading losses um, uh, over time as to earn money also in other businesses and basically cross-subsidize. And you know, to come to you on their analysis, they, well, they should have been faster. I mean, you know, ask these people that were the decision makers at the time, uh, you know, you can try to be faster, but um, if, if it's just not possible and you have to manage a balance sheet carefully, um, then I think they, they've, they've done a fair job. We've seen uh, the numbers, and, and the process is uh, fully going on. So I would say there, there hasn't been a lack of opportunities. Um, and uh, let's not forget uh, throwing hundreds of vessels at the same time in one sort or the other way on the market will also crash the market. So if you sit on so many vessels, you have to have a very, very detailed strategy how you also, what type of vessels in what segments you, you put into the market at what point in time. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. And uh, clearly the banks have large portfolios, whereas the individual company can manage its own, uh, its, its own situation. And the question, of course, is when, when do you actually conclude that you're in a restructuring situation? Uh, when do you need to start thinking about your balance sheet and your cash flows and maybe amend and strengthen? Uh, we sometimes see that 
um, special opportunity funds or restructuring experts will uh, pinpoint certain candidates as future upcoming restructuring candidates, while those exact same companies may be the winners in the equity markets and flying high on the stock exchange at the time. It's sometimes curious to see how different debt capital and equity capital will assess individual companies. And isn't that sort of a problem, Don, that there is a sort of a, a period of denial on some part of some companies that they simply won't address a potentially dangerous situation in time? Hmm. Yeah, for those of us that, that work in, on the restructuring side of this business, and I'm sure Kevin and Axel uh, would agree with me on this, that probably the biggest complaint that we would have is, is we never get to the table early enough. Uh, by the time a company gets around to engaging restructuring help, a lot of its options have, have gone by. Usually the liquidity is in, in quite a difficult situation. And so uh, the common mantra of our, our profession is, is to get in early. But I haven't seen many situations uh, where, where that's possible. And we, we're here talking about restructuring as an investment opportunity, but I, I think at the end, it's actually a, a human endeavor, and it, it's driven by the psychology of corporate loss, which for the participants in a company translates to, to personal loss as well. And psychologists will tell you that, that when a person is confronted with a form of loss, they go through five different stages. And the very first stage, as you said, uh, Ralph, is, is denial. It's a defense mechanism. Uh, you know, don't worry about it. The turnaround in dry bulk is just around the corner. Um, we can do this one, you know, in, in new money transaction and we'll be fine uh, for here on out. And it never really works out that way. And so getting through that period of denial quickly uh, helps, uh, but it is a feature of almost every restructuring situation. And I think it will be simply be because this is a, a human enterprise, it's a human endeavor, and uh, we will never get around these sort of uh, inborn defense mechanisms that we have when confronted with, with a big loss. I, I, I completely agree, and I think the you know, liquidity is always the key in these situations, and you, the companies that you've seen gone through, um, let's call it uh, more organized restructuring processes, have more liquidity to start with. So that always helps when you're not up against the wall in terms of, and you know, the other part is when you talk to your lenders, I think they always appreciate when you approach them early on um, rather than knocking on the door when the house is on fire. Hmm. I think the big problem is this huge volatility. I mean, we've seen market collapsing within a few weeks or months and um, in so far equity market price trends. Uh, nobody's got a crystal ball. So I must say personally, I'm not surprised that in certain sectors we've, we've seen share prices increasing and then just collapsing within a few weeks. I mean, because so has, uh, have the freight markets in, in the respective segments and uh, everybody needs to deal with that um, volatility. Well, the criticism one can say is, are the business models robust enough? Are the, 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 basically the employment strategies uh, well uh, thought through? Um, and there maybe the industry um, needs a bit of improvement. I think that is significantly also driven by, by the lenders today that um, are just not willing to, uh, uh, to finance uh, uh, spot market exposure to levels that they've been in the past, at least not with the amount of leverage that they used to do. But picking up on the, uh, the, the, the business model, uh, you often hear about that in the restructuring case, that you have to, to, to revamp your business, you have to prepare a new business model. Is that truly necessary, or is that something which is uh, just invented by the advisors to uh, have a new line of business? Don. Yeah, so um, it reminds me of a case where we were involved some years ago, Rolf, and I, Kevin, I think your, your firm was involved as well. Um, and I was advising the company and had spent, uh, my team and I had spent quite a bit of time working on a, a business plan for the company that we were going to uh, uh, present uh, to our creditors. And we had like three or four different series of bonds. It was quite a complex uh, creditor group. I spent quite a bit of time working on 
what the company is going to look like, what the financial projections we're, we're going to look at, what sort of costs are we going to take out of the company, and had, uh, had done this quite detailed document. And we all got invited to uh, the creditor's attorneys in, in New York at, at Bingham McCutcheon. And they had a room that was so big that everyone had to have a microphone in order to be heard on the other side of the room. And we all got assembled. And we went through this business plan and presented for about two and a half hours. And I remember at the end, there was just a few seconds of, of silence. And, and someone way down at the end of the table stood up and leaned forward into the microphone and said, where's the change? And so creditors generally look for something that is going to change in the way the company operates, the way uh, it engages with customers and its cost base. And I remember that story because every time I do a business plan from, for a client uh, now, I ask myself, where is the change? And I think if you can't demonstrate that change, um, then it's going to be very, very difficult to get the support of a creditor body going forward. Mm -hmm. Is it only the business model that has to change, or is it so that in order to satisfy creditors or attract investors, you really have to change the management, you have to change the advisors, the old advisors who assisted the company getting into the trouble, or the old management who's struggling with the psychological process of denial? Mm -hmm. uh, is, is it necessary, you think, as a sort of a general observation sometimes to change not only the business model, but uh, the people as well? I, I don't think it's a hard and fast requirement. Um, but the academic research uh, on this has focused on Chapter 11 cases in the United States. And long story short, what the researchers have found is that Chapter 11 cases are autocorrelated. And what that means is if a company goes into Chapter 11, it's the likelihood of it going into Chapter 11 again is above average. And the things that they have shown that break that cycle are, number one, a, a significant change in the senior management team, particularly the chief executive, not so much the other positions, but particularly the chief executive. And the second thing that they found is uh, that a significant change uh, to the company's business model is a barrier that breaks that, that autocorrelation and distress. So not a hard and fast rule, uh, but if you're hedging your bets and putting together a restructuring plan that you want to have some longevity and, so, and, and to be robust over a period of time, and one that is capable of securing new money and, and the support of your existing creditors, you need to take a, a very hard look at how the company does business now and what's going to change going forward. And um, usually the, the stakeholders will drive the discussion around uh, the leadership of the company. Not a hard and fast rule, but it's also uh, not uncommon to see a change of leadership of a company as it comes out of a restructuring process. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that from a German perspective? Well, it's not particularly a German thing, but I think the most important uh, strategic change in restructuring is the way how you finance your business, uh, because let's not forget, I mean, shipping, you know, if you're an offshore company, you know, you can't change your business model and become a container company, so uh, you just have to stay with what you're in. You know, you can recommend a lot, well, you need to change your employment strategy, but there is hardly any paying employment. Uh, you know, if there are no long-term charters you can fix uh, in a restructuring, you know, that doesn't work either. Of course, bringing down OPEX, uh, you know, is, is uh, something that uh, companies, uh, especially in Germany, have uh, improved a lot. I mean, we no, argue, no doubt about that the KG system, uh, system did not heavily promote OPEX efficiency, so that uh, was uh, quite a significant change we've observed with many clients over the last few years. And then last but not least, but that partly brings me back to the financing, uh, financing exercises, um, that we, we are observing mergers simply for maintaining a reasonable uh, scale of the business and, and, and for basically teaming up with people that have complementary skills. Uh, but in so far, I would say restructuring and shipping, it's uh, uh, two-thirds is uh, financing, and the rest uh, is helpful accompanying exercise. 
there may be people in the audience who have comments or questions or observations. It's a bit difficult with this light to, to see you out there, but uh, shout out if it's you okay. want to make. Yes, please. Try again. Jean Richards, Second Wind Shipping. Um, I've got two observations. The first is that there really is only one thing that needs to change, and that is more cash. Uh, you've got to have cash, and it doesn't matter whether you change your model. If the markets don't change, then you're not going to come out of it until the markets do change. The other is the motivation for Chapter 11. The reason that people go into Chapter 11 is they perceive that it will give them an opportunity. One, the opportunity of getting rid of their banks because the banks can't arrest. And if they don't come into Chapter 11, the banks can arrest, so the banks are put on hold. And the second one, there was a very good example in the States where it was the opportunity to dump all the long term, very expensive, Time charters, time chartered in tonnage. So if you see the same owner going into Chapter 11 twice or three times, it's because their motivation to do so is an opportunity to get rid of some of their problems by going into Chapter 11. That was all I was going to say. Thank you. Um, chapter 11 is, uh, of course, a big chapter in itself. Uh, but... Um, Clearly, if Seedrill files for Chapter 11, they'll do like many have done before them, and you'll get sort of a breathing pause to get things in order. Um, what do the panelists think about the, the, the various uh, schemes that are available? You have Chapter 11. Is that really an opportunity, or is it more like a threat? You have the schemes of arrangement in the UK. Uh, Germany probably has a, its own uh, um, are, insolvency Eleni, proceedings. There are too many people not sitting. Would you like to tell them? But there are too did, many. All of them? I did. Because some of them now came at the first row. They can sit at the first row. Nobody is sitting. <laughs> and then I want to uh, come and sit with us. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a free chair. The ones I told them, they came to sit. So if you can ask them. Yeah, okay. I think we'll continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me quickly say something about you know uh, German S insolvency uh, filings. Excuse me. Is uh, it, uh, was there question? someone who's actually making a question? Didn't sound like it. Asking a question? No, we heard a voice. Oh. No one. <laughs> ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, well, there are different schemes, and uh, Chapter 11, an opportunity or a threat. <laughs> we have the consensual arrangements, which are sort of prevalent, prevalent in uh, the Norwegian market. Uh, what's your thought on that? Is it? Well, well, first of all, I mean, insolvency filing procedures usually kick in when all other restructuring efforts have failed and, and the company simply needs to protection in order, in, in order to be compliant with the law. And in, in Germany, it's actually quite dramatic uh, because if you delay insolvency filing, you commit a criminal offense and you can be jailed. Um, so as the um, active managing director, you should be fully aware of your duties. Um, and and, and as to just to protect yourself, uh, sometimes uh, file uh, rather uh, sooner than later. Um, with two, basically, I would say this from, you know, from, for, for, for relevance here for this audience, we, we distinguish between two routes. The one is um, so-called self-administration. That um, is an, a scheme that has uh, basically uh, many features that we, you can observe in a Chapter 11 filing. The, the company itself remains in the driver's seat runs the process and then needs to present a plan that ultimately needs to be uh, approved by the creditors. Whereas for the usual single asset trans uh, insolvency filings, which are very, very frequent in Germany, you know, these hundreds of KG files that have filed for insolvency, it's just there's, a, there's an insolvency administrator appointed and, and, and he basically will ultimately be paid by, by the lenders. Um, 
and, and, and we will listen carefully to what the lenders have to say and, 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 and just execute a transaction um, that is convenient uh, to the lender. So, so these, these are the two parameters that usually then is definitely the end to the KG shipping fund. Um, and uh, in so far also there, there's a multitude of, of, of different ways. And um, uh, but it's, it's, it's not that much different than international context, except for this very peculiar criminal offense affair. Hmm. Don, how do you regard uh, Chapter 11 as, uh, as, as a tool, or is it uh, something uh, that is attractive? I mean, we all know the costs involved are substantial, and that's maybe one of the reasons why mm. there is some skepticism. Yeah, I, I think, uh, generally speaking, we've, over the last 10 years or, or so, we've seen a shift in the way that insolvency systems are used. It used to be, particularly um, on the continent, it used to be the end of the line for a company. And, and now I think insolvency systems, including Chapter 11, um, are more of a means of rehabilitation. And there's been some significant changes in the way schemes are used in the UK, uh, certainly a revision in the, the German insolvency code, uh, the Italian insolvency code. So now I think, um, I think uh, the, the developed markets are much more uh, about rehabilitation. Now, in terms of Chapter 11 uh, particularly, um, I have I've spent the last 15 years in in Europe, so I'm I'm not uh, up to date on everything that's happened in Chapter 11. But in in most, if not all, of my cases, we spend a lot of time trying to avoid it. Uh, I'm personally a big fan of the the consensual arrangement that is common to the Norwegian market and to many other markets in Europe. I think that is the fastest and uh, most efficient way for getting something accomplished, and it also represents the least disruption to the business. Hmm. Uh, but Chapter 11 is useful, and uh, we talked about sea drill at the outset, um, just uh, for the ability of, of a judge to discipline holdout creditors. You now you can see why sea drill would find a process like Chapter 11 useful. You have uh, all these different syndicates of banks. You have US bonds with 90% consent thresholds, Anyone that's tried to get a, a U.S. consent solicitation, that's quite a, quite a lot of work. Um, not as bad as trying to get all bank consent, but um, I, I think Chapter 11 has its place. Um, it's not for every case, but for some of these more complex ones, it certainly has a, a value to add. If I just may add one, one other thing on Chapter 11, I think there is a, a nuance there about you are what in theory, able to wipe debt off and get rid of obligations, but they do come back as deficiency claims. Mm. Um, so if you're the existing equity, you could be completely swamped by those as well. Um, so there's, there's, you know, there's a whole gamut, and you could be OSG and go in and get rid of all your deficiency claims and end up paying them out at 100 cents in a dollar in the end of the day. Yeah. I'm being made aware that uh, we're out of time. I'll just ask one final question to the panel. I mean, m most of us uh, on the podium have been very busy over the past three years in various types of restructuring work, but mo most of it has been, or quite a bit of it has been a kick the can approach that you amend and extend. And now uh, many of the restructuring candidates have succeeded in getting amend and extend solutions. Are we going to see the same process over again in 2018, 2019? Yes or no? Alex. No, I, first of all, I don't subscribe to the statement at all. I, I think we've, we've seen so many, you know, fresh money uh, teaming up with uh, shipping companies that um, I wouldn't say we haven't kicked the can down the road. Uh, to a certain degree, kicking the can down the road might be a meaningful exercise, but uh, I don't subscribe to the statement. Okay, good. Let's, let's uh, end on that optimistic note and thank you to the panelists. <laughs>